All right. Good morning, Stockholm. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right, let's try this. Uh, good morning, Stockholm. All right. So let's try this. How many in here speak uh, Swedish? Raise your hand. Probably 80, 90, 85%. How many in here do not speak Swedish? 5%. I feel like I'm going to go into a different, talk, like a Venn diagram talk here. It's like Swedish, not Swedish, should be 100% kind of a thing. Uh, that's actually not what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about something different. I'm going to be talking about this. Nice couple of fellas over there. So my name is, well, for the 80% Emil Efrem, and for the 5% Emil Efrem. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Neo4j, which was started here in Sweden. Um, we uh, have our engineering HQ in Malmö, which is where we got started, um, and our headquarters in Silicon Valley, which is where I moved uh, about eight, nine years ago, something like that. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the Panama Papers and how we got embedded in what ended up being one of the biggest news stories of 2016, even, 2000, even though 2016 was an interesting year because we ended up with both Trump and Brexit. Uh, but prior to all that, uh, the Panama Papers happened. And we are a small technology company, so it's kind of odd for us to get embedded and ultimately become very essential to a story like this. Um, and so I'll share a little bit uh, about the kind of behind the scenes uh, from, from that story. Um, before that, though, I only have one ground rule for all my talks. It was the same 10 years ago when I spoke at JFocus for the first time back in 2010. Uh, it's the same today, which is I do not want your undivided attention. Um, you, you all have uh, phones, um, laptops. The, apparently, the Wi-Fi supposedly works here. Let's try it out. Um, tweet about this. Uh, let me know if I'm doing well, if I'm doing poorly. Um, the only thing that I ask of you is that you use the JFocus hashtag and the Neo4j hashtag. Because we monitor at least the Neo4j hashtag religiously. So that's it. Um, the Panama Papers. Um, the biggest news story of 2016, at least for the first half of 2016. And just to give you a little bit of a reminder, because this was, uh, was, this was a while ago, this story, like many stories, like some of the stories we heard the, this morning, of course, starts with a few heroes. And there are several heroes in, these, in this story. I'm going to start calling out three. Uh, the first two are two journalists, both of them confusingly named Obermeier, last name, at a, a local newspaper in Munich, in München, Germany, um, called Süddeutsche Zeitung. Süddeutsche Zeitung, a very high quality newspaper with a great investigative journalism team. And they, both of them, both of the Obermeiers were in this uh, journalism team. And the third hero is an anonymous whistleblower. That's the one that you saw in the video called John Doe. Still, you know, four years later, we have no idea who it is. The, he, is only, he or she is only known as, as John Doe. Um, and this John Doe contacted the Süddeutsche Zeitung, these two journalists, um, and reached out to them and said basically what you saw in that video, which is, I work at a law firm. I, actually, I don't know if he, if he said that he worked at the law firm, but he said he had access to information from a particular law firm in the Panama called Mossack Fonseca. Mossack Fonseca. 
and he said, I have all of their internal data dating back to their year of origin, 1977, all the way up until 2016. Are you interested in this? And they said, yes, of course. And you know, they asked him, why are you doing this? Because I want to expose what these guys are doing. And so they took this data, ended up being 2.6 terabytes of data that they got from John Doe. And then they said, okay, how are we going to analyze this? They realized that they couldn't do this alone, or rather, this was a global story. This was not a local Munich story, local Germany story. So in order for this to have the most impact, they should really collaborate with journalists all over the world. So they reached out to this organization called the ICIJ, the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which is based in DC. Um, it's a small team who's locally employed by them, about a dozen, 15 people at, at the time. But they work with hundreds of journalists from all over the world. And the goal is to, to, to make more efficient cross-border investigations. And what may not be intuitive and obvious uh, to all of us is that journalism is actually fairly competitive. So if you get a, a, an interesting lead for a story, you're very unlikely to share that with your friends at some other newspaper. And why? Because they're actually your competitors, right? You want to leak that, you want to get that story out earlier than they want to. So it's very counterintuitive and very countercultural for the Obermeyers to actually do this. But they ended up doing it. They reached out to the ICIJ. They took a look at that data and said, this is an amazingly interesting data set. We need to try to look at this from a global perspective. And so why was this interesting? Well, it turns out that Mossack Fonseca, as a law firm, they were specialized in what's called offshore tax havens. And so what that means is that these are jurisdictions, these are countries where you don't have a lot of visibility into them and where there's typically low or no taxes, right? So they were used for offshore tax planning. And offshore tax planning can be used for legal tax planning purposes. We're perfectly fine to do that. But it can also be used for illegal tax evasion, right? So if you have a lot of money that you got in some way, and you want to hide that from the authorities, you stick it into an account, you set up an entity in Panama or the Bahamas or the BVI, the British Virgin Islands, something like this, and you use a law firm like Mossack Fonseca uh, to do that. So the ICIJ started looking at this data and ultimately uh, they ended up concluding a number of really interesting things. So here's a chronology in the early 2015, um, John Doe reached out to the Süddeutsche Zeitung. They contacted the ICIJ. They started digging into the data and activating their broad network, their graph uh, of, of journalists from all over the world, and they started investigating this. And then in April of, of 2016, the news leaked, the news, not the news leaked, the news were published. Um, this is Edward Snowden tweeting about it, the biggest leak in the history of data journalism in, in April of 2016. So let's take a little bit of a peek under the hood of what is actually going on here from a technology perspective. So first of all, this was a massive data set, right? 2.6 terabytes, just to give you some context of 2.6 terabytes from a journalistic perspective are some other famous uh, journalistic leaks. Um, and you see their sizes, and then you see the Panama Papers data dump. And in our world, we think of terabytes, and that's like, eh, my phone can probably do a terabyte these days, right? Or at least the next version of my phone, right? Because, um, you know, terabytes sounds like, you know, actually we do that all the time, even petabytes type scale. Um, but if you think about it, the data sets that, you, that you've used of that size, they're almost always, I would guess that they're actually always <laughs> going to be either machine generated or generated as a side effect of some fairly rudimentary activity by a large volume of people. So think clickstream data, for example, for the latter, or sensor data as an example of the former, right? This data was 
a bunch of emails dating back to, I guess, not 1977, right, but whatever, 80s, early 90s. They were forms that people had filled out by hand. They were passport scans and things like that, right? So very manual, human-generated data that all built up all the way up to uh, 2.6 terabytes. So massive data set, right? And then the question is, okay, so how do you make sense of all of that, right? So this is what the team looked like. They ended up activating almost 400 journalists worldwide, 80 countries. This was a truly global operation, right? Uh, working for over 100 media organizations and tons of um, local folks here in, in, in Sweden, in the US, globally all over the world. Supporting all of that, was a team of three developers and three data journalists, right? A really, really tiny team that ended up supporting hundreds of journalists looking through all of this information, right? And an almost impossible task. So the question then is, how were they able to pull this off? Well, because they were so tiny, the only way they could pull it off was by using a lot of off-the-shelf technologies, right? And what was interesting, one of the many things that is interesting with the, with the Panama paper story, but in particular from a, from a technology perspective, is that this leak technically could have happened 10 years earlier in 2006. If that would have happened in 2006, none of the stories would ever have been published because the technology was not available to a tiny team of three, five, six, 12 people. You needed to be at Facebook scale or at Google scale or something like that to be able to work with that type of data. But it happened in 2016 and they were able to pull together a number of very interesting open source components uh, to make this happen. At a very high level, this is what they wanted to accomplish from, a, from an architecture perspective. They had the raw files Again, emails, uh, passport scans, government forms. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the chart before, they had uh, something that they called database formats, which is basically CSV dumps of the database that was internal to, to, to the law firm. So they had all that, and they wanted to take that data, and they wanted to somehow being able to look into it and try to find out if there are stories here, newsworthy stories uh, worthy of writing about. Um, so with the stuff that was already in metadata, so think emails where you have a from and a to and a subject, it was actually pretty easy to pull that out, as you can imagine. You extracted the metadata, you stored that in a, in a database. Obviously, for things like PDFs, passport scans, things like that, you had to run it through some kind of OCR process to get the raw data, the raw text, which you then would enter into the database. And then ultimately, once you have it all in some kind of a database, you can start looking into this and make it, for the, for the, from the developer's perspective, make it available to their journalists, right? So that's at a high level. So they did that, pulled together a number of open source tools for ETLs, for OCRing, and so on and so forth. And then they put it into this database, which obviously, you know, that's where we, that's where we came into it. But the first thing they did, actually, when they had that data, is that they, they just put it into a simple Lucene index, right? So the first thing they wanted to achieve was, hey, let me just search this data, right? So they put together this, um, or actually they reused this open source tool called Blacklight, which is typically used by libraries, like by the ABM market, so libraries and, and museums and folks like that. They modified that a little bit, but think of this just as a, as a UX on top of Lucene, or in this case, on top of Solar. Um, fairly easy, but all of a sudden you can search across this entire data set, right, in free text, which is actually really powerful. Um, but what they learned pretty quickly was that they searched for kind of an interesting name, maybe a politician in their home country or something like that, and they ended up getting thousands, tens of thousands of hits, right? For those of you, I guess Matthias said that we first met 50 years ago, which isn't quite true. But for those of you who were around, you know, in the early days of the internet, uh, there was a search engine called Alta Vista. Who here remembers Alta Vista? Wow. All right. Who here does not remember Alta Vista? Oh my, oh, that was like 50%. Man, okay, we need to, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do the Venn diagram uh, keynote tutorial next year at, at JFocus. Um, so with Alta Vista, which is one of the most popular search engines in the early days of the internet, it, it became popular because it was super fast and it was very powerful and all that good stuff. But after a while, the Alta Vista effect kicked in, as it, be, as it became known, which was that no matter what you searched for, you got thousands of hits, right? 
And initially, you would think that's a good thing, except there were thousands of hits, and like you couldn't find any, any relevant information, right? And that's ultimately what Google came around and, 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 and figured out how to solve. And how did Google do this? Well, Google had exactly the same approach to web search as AltaVista did. Let's crawl the entire web. Let's download that into our data center. Let's search. So if there's a web page that says JFocus, and I search for JFocus, if, if in the text it says JFocus, I search for JFocus, I'm going to serve up that page, right? But what Google realized was that, hey, you know what? Let's do that. But in order to serve out the best search results, we're going to rank them, and rank them based on what? Based on how these documents are connected, right? So they chose a graph algorithm called eigenvector centrality that they made some tweaks to and coined, they, they named it PageRank after Larry Page, one of, the, um, one of the two inventors. That was the key innovation that allowed Google to filter through these thousands or tens of thousands or, or millions actually of search hits on the web and filter out and rank the top 10 ones. And we all know that if you're on the first page of Google versus the second or third or fourth, it's a huge difference, right? Because Google just made that so awesome, so awesomely relevant by using this connected data view of that information that there's no reason usually to even go beyond page one, right? So the ICIJ, the ICIJ team had a, sim, a similar revelation where they said that, you know, we have too many hits here, but we should start looking at this in a different way. So taking a step back, where are we now? So we've had all the, we, they've gotten all this information, right? And they've been able to, through a series of advanced steps, extract it into 11 and a half million documents, right? And they want to try to make sense of that. If we take a, take a step away from technology for a moment and just think about investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is actually about finding patterns, right? You try to find unintuitive patterns or patterns that some people try to find, right? So let me talk, let me talk to, you a little, to, to you a little bit about patterns. Here's an example of a pattern. You have a person. Um, that person has an account in a bank, right? That is your pattern right there, yes. You nodded, exactly. It's my pattern, it's, it's everyone in here. Like, it's not a particularly interesting pattern. Um, even though you are particularly super interesting. Um, this is a different pattern. We build on that same thing. Let's say that this person lives at an address over here. Another person is living at that address. That person is an officer in a company, and that company has a bank account in a known offshore tax haven. That is probably not true for you. <laughs> it's not true for me either. But all of a sudden, this is a much more interesting pattern, right? And what if we could start finding those kinds of patterns in this massive data set, right? So in the graph world, you know, obviously, I, I grew up in graph databases. I tend to take a graph view of, of the world. It was my, my heart beat a little bit extra when Danielle talked about graph multiple times in, in, in the previous talk, although it was a different graph, but still, the, the, just the term made me really happy. Um, in the graph world, we call these concepts the, the round circles here, then we call them nodes, right? And they're the nouns in your domain, so to speak, right? We call the arrows between them, the connections, we call them relationships. And with key value properties on both nodes and on relationships, those are the fundamental building blocks, the primitives of, of graph databases. With that, you can model everything. Right? And what's really powerful is if you can take this model and you can put it into a data infrastructure that can scale not just to whatever seven nodes here, but it can handle all the 11 and a half million nodes or billions of nodes, in fact. Um, that can create some really interesting opportunity to finding stories at a global scale. So, Switching gears a little bit, the question is, what does this look like in practice? And I now realize that my computer has gotten suspended. I'm now going to go into um, a live demo. And the really good news is that uh, even though my computer just got suspended, uh, we all know that live demos always work. So I'm super confident nothing is going to break. All right, cool. Uh, 
Yes, I believe we can. You can see it. All right, let's launch into my screen, please. Sweet. All right. That looks great. <laughs> we are off to a great start. All right, let's see if this works. It's still looking for Wi-Fi over here. I may have to do like an improvised song and dance version of this demo. Is that okay? So, all right, so I have the Panama Papers data here, and I'm gonna search for an officer. Woo, I get data back. So officer is what in the, in the Panama Papers data. It's basically what they call human beings, right? You're an officer of a company, for example, right? And so here's an example of uh, a bunch of officers in here. You can zoom in, and all of a sudden you start seeing names. I don't know how visible this is for you, but you see some names here. Um, it says the bearer on many of them, which is actually an artifact of, of the data. It is an old term for a type of shareholder that physically is bearing, is carrying, um, a token that means you're an owner of a company. And whoever is bearing, whoever is, is carrying that, that token is the actual owner of it, right? So you're, you're not registered as a human being on it. There's no records anywhere. It's just whoever holds that physical piece. So that is what the bearer means. So this is data that is now put into Neo4j that ended up coming out of that 2.6 terabytes, the 11 and a half million documents. And we can just search it right here, right? So we can take this inter-global construction thing and we we can look at some interesting stuff. We can say, for example, how are these two connected? Let's see if they are. Let's see if there's a shortest path between them. Yes. All right, sweet. So now, all of a sudden, I don't know if this is visible on the big screen, we can see that these two random people that I chose, CN Limited and Intergalactic, are connected to each other through several intermediaries and law firms, and so somehow they belong to the same companies, right? That, that's the kind of stuff, imagine that if you got back that list of 1,000 or 10,000 hits from the Alta Vista-like search, and you wanted to find something like this, it is probably doable, it just it would take forever. Right? And with this at their fingertips, the journalists were able to all of a sudden find all kinds of interesting things. Uh, so let's take an example of that. Let's see if I can clear this. Let's see here, Sigmundur. All right, Sigmundur David Gunnlaugsson. Sounds very Scandinavian, doesn't it? Um, does anyone recognize that name? All right, who is this? All right, shout louder. You can do it. Yes, the now former Prime Minister of Iceland. He was the Prime Minister of Iceland when the Panama Papers broke. So what ended up happening was that Sigmundur was the Prime Minister of Iceland it turned out that he had been the shareholder of a company called Wintris. Um, but if you look at the shareholder of data, this is very, very hard for you to make out probably. But you can say here, see here that it says end date of that relationship. The relationship between Sigmundur and Wintris has an end date in December 2009, which is around the time, maybe it was exactly the year, uh, when he became the prime minister or an active politician or something like that. So he had actually sold his shares then. So maybe that was fine, but it turns out that he also had a registered address here, Luca Stiger or something or another. And if you look at that, all of a sudden we see, wait, there's someone else who's living at that address, Anna Paul's daughter. And if we look at her, wait, all of a sudden, she is registered to Wintris as well. And she has two shareholder relationships. And then we can click on them and we see that this one started in, in 2007. And this one started exactly when Sigmundur's relationship ended. And so this tipped off the journalist that something fishy was going on here. Oh, because it turns out, I should have probably pointed that out. If you look at Wintris, oh, yeah, they, were, they had a bank account in the Panama. 
in an offshore tax haven. This was something that he had not disclosed, and he had tried to sell it to who subsequently turned out to be his wife uh, for a dollar or whatever, a euro or an Icelandic krona. I don't know, for something, for some low amount uh, on exactly the same date. So this was exposed in the Panama Papers. They were confronted actually by SVT, SVT, the, the Swedish public uh, television, um, who, who was there together with some local journalists, and he ended up ultimately resigning over this fact. So an interesting way to look at this data. Now, speaking of interesting, uh, I picked on you before, so I'm not going to pick on you anymore. But uh, let's see here. Front row is really dangerous. What's your name? All right. <laughs> okay, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Uh, does anyone have a neighbor they want me to type in, or something like that? Uh, wow, well, that's probably not a good idea. I run an American company now, so I know what kind of liability that would... Donald Trump. Donald Trump, that's an interesting one. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Is this being recorded? <laughs> Catch me afterwards. We'll talk afterwards. But we can look in Stockholm, right? So here are some of the addresses in Stockholm. Right? We can zoom in, Magnevägen, Drottninggatan. We can start looking at, so what's going on at Drottninggatan? Oh, someone is, is actually registered here, whoever that is, right? And then we can, what did you say? Did you say Trump? I don't know what Trump Trading Limited is, but it sounds interesting, so we can find that. All right, let's see if this dude over here is related to this Trump thing over there. So we can find, is there a path between them? Shortest path? It turns out it is. Oh, well, there you go. So I'm going to zoom rapidly out of this right now. <laughs> and not go any further. But this is the kind of stuff that is that, it's that easy to do that when you put the data in a powerful database that can do things like finding patterns in, in data. Right? And this is all, this is all public data. It's available. Um, it exists um, off of uh, uh, the ICIJ website. OK, good. Yeah. Can you switch back to the presentation? It exists off of the ICIJ website, right? And actually off of the Neo4j website, too. And I'll give you some links uh, towards the end. Let's see how we're doing on time. I got carried away there with uh, the whole Trump thing. Um, so a few more minutes. Cool. So what this ended up being, again, was like this massive worldwide story, broke all over the world, that was the impact. They actually ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize, the ICIJ did, in 2017 for the Panama Papers uh, story. Uh, it was uh, an amazing moment. Uh, but probably most importantly was that it exposed a bunch of people who had money stuck away in ways that they had not publicly disclosed, right? Several of them were politicians, several of them were big, you know, and important business leaders. One of the first things that happened when this, when um, um, the, the Panama Papers broke was that the Neo4j engineer started looking for me in there. But luckily enough, I wasn't, I wasn't in there. Um, so, all right, so that's fine, uh, you know, but what does this mean to you? So, I think to me, what's interesting about this story from a developer perspective, from a technology perspective, is what we alluded to before, which is that 10 years ago, this story would not have been possible, right? Because these three developers, these three data journalists, the only way they could make this happen was by using this really rich ecosystem of open source technologies and compute and storage off of these public cloud platforms. Right? that are commoditized today. And with just that, that power at their fingertips, a few developers could impact something as huge as this. So that is my urge to all of you here. That is how easy it is if, if these three people, these six, six um, people, could make this happen at a global scale, you can probably make something like that happen locally for you, for your company, or maybe even for public society. 
It used to be that this technology was only the property of these big web firms, right? Only at Google scale or at Twitter scale or at Facebook scale were you able to do this, but that is no longer true. The Panama Papers is available on Neo4j's site. We have a bunch of open source stuff. We have an open source community edition of our database. You can uh, go and you can launch what we call a sandbox, which is purely just a tab in your web browser. Um, and you can go there, you sign up with your social ID, and in a minute you have a Neo4j instance running. You launch the sandbox and bam, you have the Panama Papers right there. And you can start looking up your neighbor or see if they're connected to Trump or whatever it is that you, that you want to do. Um, there's a bunch of other sandboxes too if you want to look at more typical graph database use cases like recommendation engines or customer 360 or fraud detection. It's pre-populated with, with data sets uh, for, to allow you to do that. So, Finally, uh, I want to call, since this is a local conference, I don't usually give talks in, in Sweden anymore, but it's been fantastic to be here. We are always hiring. We are 300 people right now at Neo4j. We want to be 500 by the end of the year. We are hiring as many qualified developers as we possibly can. So if you think this is interesting, go to neo4j.com slash jobs. We also have a booth here at the conference. We'll be here for the entire day. I'm going to be there for most of today. Um, but colleagues will be here throughout the conference. Come up, talk to us. And most importantly, have a fantastic conference. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>